The patrons have spoken, and they have given us an underrated sleeper favorite from Generation 4, Dropion. Those who played Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum will recall, perhaps not so fondly, given how annoying it could be to get around the bog, traversing Pastoria City's Great Marsh, and encountering Skorupi, which, after much training, would evolve into the fearsome Dropion. Those who didn't do so would still encounter it too, as it was Elite Four Aaron's strongest Pokemon, wielding an infuriatingly strong cross poison. Also, if you had a nickel for each fully evolved scorpion Pokemon to come out of Generation 4, you'd have two nickels, which isn't that much, but it's still weird that we got Dropion and Gliscor in the same gen. Today, we'll be exploring if Dropion was able to bear its vampiric fangs to good effect in the competitive scene. And thus, we ask, how good was Dropion actually? Man, Dropion's scary looking ogre scorpion design is pretty fearsome. It looks like it could be something from our sponsor of this video, Raid Shadow Legends. That's right, one of the biggest mobile games that has global PvP and PvE is sponsoring this video, and they want us to let you know that they've got a ton of champions, over 600 in fact. They've also got an insane variety of bosses like this one named Bombo the Dreadhorde. He's a lava rhino, what else needs to be said? And as usual, Raid never seems to stop having events like this month with Raid's Forge Pass Season 3, with some amazing rewards on offer, including a limited edition artifact set. And if that's not enough, Raid's bringing out some new champions along with some awesome looking champion skins for the incredible Madam Ceres. But wait, here's the actual big news. Later this month, Raid is giving everybody's favorite champion the upgrade he deserves. You might have seen his struggle for awesomeness in some of Raid's hilarious videos, but finally, Death Knight is becoming a legendary champion. If you're new to the game, this is the best time to get started with Raid, especially since they can't help but give you free stuff in-game. And if you click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on screen, you'll get unique bonuses that have a value of $30. We're talking a free epic champion named Ina, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard. So you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in-game. All this treasure will be waiting for you right up here. And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Solid and well-rounded though it was, Dropion's stat spread wasn't quite sufficient to make it OU material in its debut generation. Some players briefly experimented with its unique traits, but not to any serious degree. However, Dropion found a solid niche in the tier below, UU. On one hand, it had plenty of stringent competition, as it was one of the many stat pursuit users in the tier, using its talents to remove pesky ghosts and psychic types like Miss Magius, Rotom, and Mesprit for the benefit of its teammates, which it was excellent at doing. However, Dropion was thoroughly unique among its competition by virtue of several significant distinguishing advantageous characteristics. Its grounded poison typing allowed it to serve the function of a team's toxic spikes absorber, while crucial resistances to both grass and poison allowed it to function as a solid Venusaur check. An incredible trait for any team to have given Venusaur's dominance over the tier, and as such it was also a trait that could be difficult to fit at times. Now these traits were shared by Skunk Tank, but Dropion was the tier's preferred poison dark pursuiter by virtue of its excellent speed, which gave it the jump on a significant portion of the metagame's opposing offensive Pokemon that were already considered fairly speedy, such as Moltres and non-scarf Rotom. Furthermore, Dropion could run Pursuit in a variety of different guises. It could combine this reliable trapping ability with an effective revenge killing Choice Scarf set, a deceptively hard hitting wall breaker of a Choice Band set, which also gave Dropion the valuable gift of harder hitting Pursuits, or with the seemingly endless flexibility of a utility offense set, which could run a number of items, from Lumberry for will o to Black Glasses for increased dark power without locking into a move, to Shookaberry to completely turn the tables on a would-be revenge kill from Dugtrio, while also generally allowing Dropion more flexibility in the face of the tier's many earthquakes that would otherwise threaten it, to Black Sludge's extra longevity, which most notably bolstered Dropion's capacity to withstand Venusaur, while also nicely accentuating for its already solid general hit-taking ability. Its move pool was similarly expansive. On non-choice sets, all it really needed was Crunch, in addition to Pursuit, obviously, to ensure that, if it so desired, it could strike its Pursuit targets which would rarely switch out as hard as possible. No other moves in Dropion's Ovra possess such an obligatory nature, and as such, Dropion could mix and match its last two move slots to whatever its trainer liked. Just like the choice sets, the utility sets usually ran Earthquake, which made it an excellent check to Toxicroak, and often ran Aqua Till for its capacity to smack 
Moltres, and Rhyperior. It could also run Ice Fang to solid effect, notably crushing Torterra and Altaria. However, these non-choice variants also often dipped into lesser seen moves. Most common among these was Taunt, which Dropion made excellent use of to help its team dismantle Stall. However, it could also irritate opposing teams immensely with the item removal of Knockoff, the phasing capabilities of Whirlwind, and even laying hazards on its own with Toxic Spikes. It could go so far as to run the best move in its arsenal not yet touched upon, Sword Stance. SD would be a highlight of most other Pokemon's move pools, but Dropion was such an excellent pursuiter that SD was an afterthought to it, since users of Pursuit and SD were so diametrically opposed in terms of strategy. Nevertheless, Dropion had the freedom of moveset to potentially slap SD in his last slot alongside Earthquake, since, as mentioned before, its other moves weren't obligatory to its functioning. So the downsides of potentially wasting a slot, so to speak, on SD were quite low, while its potential benefits of SD were quite high. In many games, Dropion was not called upon to Pursuit, and thus could focus on being a threat with SD, since Crunch and Earthquake alone provided the coverage it truly needed. But you may wonder, what about focusing entirely on Dropion's Swords Dancing capabilities? If it could be such a threat with it, did anyone do that? Certainly, they did. Speaking of moveset versatility, Dropion had plenty of it beyond Pursuit, as much as it was a defining place of the tier precisely for that move. Yet, it could and did run other sets, and it did so to great effect. And the most notable example of this were its Swords Dance variants. Yes, variants plural, because Dropion was so diverse that it didn't even run SD in one way. The most common method for it to do so was an all-out attacking set, usually equipped with extra power from Life Orb, and packing Aqua Tail's excellent additional coverage in its fourth move slot. However, Dropion could also take the strategy at a slower pace by running a Swords Dance variant equipped with Black Sludge's healing in addition to plentiful bulk investment. Dropion became incredibly hard for the bulky Pokemon populating defensive teams to even hurt, and in conjunction with Taunt to stop Hazes with Will-O-Wisp from Milotic, Weezing, and Spiritomb, bulky SD Dropion became renowned as a stall killer. It utterly throttled these teams, both mowing through them, stifling their ability to use moves, and shrugging off their hits with ease. Furthermore, it wasn't just an anti-stall Pokemon. The bulk investment also increased its defensive utility against offensive teams by letting it withstand moves it otherwise collapsed against, like Alakazam's Focus Blast, and making it excellent at repeatedly switching into Venusaur. And even that isn't all. It wasn't enough that Dropion was great at both Pursuit and Source Dance. It could also function as a highly effective lead. In the wake of the Frost Last ban, Yu Yu searched for other effective lead spikers, and the outstanding Quillfish became the new go-to option for the role. With its high speed and taunt, Dropion shut lead Quillfish down hard. That was far from the only thing it did, though. It also completely dominated the Pixie leads Yuxi and Mesprit, which were two of the most popular, defining leads in the metagame. It also shredded the increasingly popular Miss Magius lead, with Lumberry shrugging off would-be Will-O-Wisp burns. The Lumberry also let Dropion come out on top of against Venusaur leads. Dropion could even try funky tricks like sliding in Rock Slide to lure lead Moltres, or potentially even a lead Scyther looking to stay in and hit it with Aerial Ace. It was an excellent, effective anti-metagame lead. Finally, Dropion could take the concept of its bulky SD set even further. It would drop SD and focus entirely on bulk. Especially defensive Dropion was not only a terrific wall, especially if it chose to run Rest and Sleep Talk, and thus became a Sleep Absorber, which made it even more of a terrific Venusaur answer, but it was also incredibly obnoxious to switch into thanks to the Whirlwind's phasing and knockoffs item removal. As such, it was a great sleeper pick on hazard heavy stall teams and could even potentially contribute to the hazard mayhem by laying toxic spikes. So all in all, Dropion could fulfill a variety of crucial roles on a bevy of DPP UU teams, and it was a great performer. In spite of this, it remained underrated, but those who played the tier knew that Dropion was a legitimate, effective part of it, and thus Dropion's debut generation was a success successful one. Generation 5's well-known power creep meant Dropion wouldn't be returning to Yu Yu. Instead, it joined the ranks of the first ever RU metagame, which happened to look like the Yu Yu tier of the generation prior. However, whereas Dropion had primarily been a pursuiter in that metagame, now it was most commonly seen as a Swords Dancer, with its boosted crunches mowing through much of the tier. Dropion was a highly effective Swords Dancer for several reasons. One, it was quite fast, faster than most other offensive Pokemon, including that all-important above Moltres Bench 
benchmark. This meant that while Source Dance is generally meant to rip through bulkier teams, it was also threatening against offense. Two, it was an excellent physical attacker because it completely dominated several of the tier's go-to physical walls. Its boosted stab poison jab tore through the Tangrowth that was seemingly immovable for so many other physical threats, whereas Drapion's toxic immunity meant that Alomomola couldn't poison it and put it on a timer, and Lumberry meant that even a lucky Scald Burn wouldn't put an end to Drapion's bid for a sweep. This also helped it shrug off tactics like Lilligant and Tangrowth Sleep Powder, Amoongus' Spore, and Embor and Spiritune's Will-O-Wisp. Drapion had valuable defensive utility as well, being excellent at warding off the highly threatening offensive grass types Lilligant and Sceptile, while stifling Mesprit and Uxie just as much as it had before. To make matters even better, Drapion's naturally superb defense stat meant it wasn't automatically revenge killed by one of the most popular Pokemon to usually do so, Durant. And it took Entei's choice band extreme speeds incredibly well too. As if all that wasn't enough, Drapion's ability to absorb Toxic Spice was phenomenal. Drapion was not without flaw, however. The tier had plenty of faster, high-powered special attacks and Earthquake, which made it difficult to complete sweeps against offense. It could also struggle to find opportunities to switch in safely against such teams, and it often didn't pose too much of a threat against teams that were still healthy thanks to its sometimes underwhelming base 90 attack. As such, Drapion tended to be a late-game Pokemon, almost exclusively against popular offensive teams, and this was a burden on team building, meaning if Drapion couldn't just be thrown on, it had to be chosen with precision. Nevertheless, Drapion was a solid Pokemon in Generation 5 RU, with plenty of payoff for the enterprising player. Several of Generation 6's most massive, defining changes seem tailor-made to benefit Drapion. First off, the introduction of Fairy types. Not only did this give new value to Drapion's Poison Stab, which hit them super effectively, but it even made Drapion's Dark type Stab more threatening, since Fairy types wouldn't want to switch into it. Drapion's Dark Stab was made even better by the fact that it was no longer resisted by Steel types. But you might think Drapion's Stab wasn't that strong, and yes, that's true. But Generation 6 also gave an incredible incredible buff to knock off, and Drapion wielded it with maximum efficiency, using it both for its massive strength and to harass the opposing team with item removal. It returned to the RU tier with a vengeance. Before it had been a solid sleeper pick, but now it was a top tier metagame warping menace. Many dark weak Pokemon were forced to use Culverberry as their item, largely in response to the prominence of Drapion's knockoff. Of course, this didn't stop it from excelling. No matter what set it used, Drapion was one of the best Pokemon in the tier. Once again, it used its superb speed to brandish Source Dance with terrifying efficiency, shredding through most of the metagame's most popular bulkier Pokemon. Teams relying on cores featuring combinations of Pokemon like Alomomola, Venusaur, Deancey, and Registeel would find significant portions of their squads torn apart by Drapion. What made Drapion particularly dangerous was that, yes, there were Pokemon that could take hits from it, but they couldn't do so repeatedly, thanks to knockoff removing leftovers. Furthermore, its capacity to take a hit or two made it even better. Not only did you have to withstand its attack, but you also had the difficult task of taking it out in return. Both the knockoff lefty's removal and Drapion's great bulk featured in his matchup against what initially seemed like a good check, but was quickly discovered didn't quite work that well. Escavalier. Furthermore, Drapion was massively threatening because of its consistent performances, even if you knew what was coming. But what really elevated it was how it could effortlessly give itself the element of surprise as well. For instance, with Shukaberry in place of the standard lump, Pokemon like Flygon, Rapira, and Dugtrio while it was in the tier, would find the tables completely turned on them. When it wasn't tearing through teams with Source Dance, Drapion was one of the best, most common choice Scarfers in the tier. It possessed the perfect blend of pursuit trapping threats like Sigilyph, acting as a valuable check to other threats like Virizion, and cleaning up weakened offensive teams late game. As a bonus, Drapion was a choice Scarfer that retained use against slow, bulky teams. Not only was its item removing knockoff always useful, but it had the move slot freedom to potentially run Toxic Spice if it desired, providing its team with even more utility. Of course, as great as SD and Scarf were, they were sometimes lacking in immediate first turn power. But that probably disappeared when Drapion equipped itself with a Choice Band. Choice Band made its knockoffs downright nightmarish to switch into, and helped it pursue weak targets like Bronzong and Yuxi with even greater efficiency. This was especially valuable when Cresselia and Dual Blade were in the tier, and Drapion was one of the few Pokemon capable of taking them on. Choice Band helped bring the best out of Drapion's already excellent offensive traits, allowing it to both wall break and pursuit trap with 
with ease. It didn't have to do anything fancy, just click the most powerful attack. Funnily enough, this same approach was utilized by some players who enjoyed using Pursuit SC Drapion. This made it particularly ruthless at destroying protect Pokemon like Bronzong, which hoped to scout the intentions of a choice Drapion set. No matter which set it chose, Drapion was always among a metagame defining battle consistent Pokemon and thoroughly earned its position as one of RU's elites. Drapion returned to RU again in Generation 7. Though Power Creep marred it slightly, it remained a solid Pokemon. It primarily went with the Choice Band set, as not needing a turn of setup to be offensively threatening allowed for the most consistent results. It required Choice Band's instant power to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with common RU Pokemon. For example, without Choice Band, it wouldn't be able to threaten to KO Toxicroak or Mega Obamasone with Earthquake or Poison Jab, respectively. As always, Drapion's bread and butter was its Dark Stab duel of Knockoff and Pursuit. The former was as obnoxious to switch into as ever, and the latter remained crucial in the inescapable removal of several of the metagame's best Pokemon. Its best trait was how thoroughly it threatened the top tier Metagross and the Necrozma, while reliably removing familiar faces like Miss Magius and Bronzong. Another one of Drapion's best, most unique traits was its excellent matchup against Rose Raid. It resisted both stabs and could prey on Rose's weak defense stat to scare it out and slam it hard as a switch with a fully powered pursuit, even though Rose Raid was neutral to the move. It wasn't always easy to slot Drapion on to a team. The metagame was full of outstanding poison types like Salazzle, Roserade, Needle Queen, Toxicroak, and Dragalge. However, Drapion's excellent pursuiting capabilities, which had no rival, let alone peer, in the metagame, ensured it always had a genuine important role. This allowed it to facilitate the effectiveness of teammates like Passimian like few other Pokemon could. Drapion was occasionally slept on, but that just made it all the more fearsome and useful when it did show up. And thus, good players who knew just how much it could bring to a team were able to get the most out of it to great results and thus Drapion had another great RU showing in Generation 7. Generation 8 deleted Pursuit from the game and Drapion suffered accordingly. Fortunately, unlike its fellow 4th gen poison dark pursuiter Skunk Tank, pursuiting was not the only thing it could do. Nevertheless, it was a significant blow, and Drapion's first generation 8 appearance was in early UU, while Gengar was still legal. And so was Dynamax. Drapion was the only Pokemon around that resisted Gengar's lethal stabs and wasn't weak to any of its coverage moves to boot. As such, specially defensive Drapion appeared for the first time since generation 4, and it instantly became more common than it ever had been prior by virtue of being the only option to prevent Gengar from bowling over pretty much everything. It wasn't a perfect answer, as it still took heavy damage from a nasty plot and life orb boosted focus blast, but the fact it was able to take that hit in the first place was better than the entire rest of the metagame. As such, Drapion had an incredibly important defensive niche in stopping this insanely broken beast. That is, until Gengar Dynamax and blew it away with Max Starfall or Max Knuckle. Now, of course, Drapion could stop this by Dynamaxing itself. Does this sound like a chaotic metagame? That's good, because it was, and continued to be until Dynamax was Dynaxed. Amazing jokes aside, the tears went through massive shifts, and Drapion found itself in RU once again. It was a great wall breaker, threatening pretty much the entire tier with Swords Dance. It was especially effective since it was a physical attacker that tore through common physical walls in Aromatis, Vaporeon, and Vileplume. If it wasn't SDing up, it was a great Scarfer, offensively answering Salazzo, Verizion, Rotomo, and Alolan Raichu. However, SD was what really let Drapion make its mark on RU in its fourth appearance in the tier. It was especially vicious once the Isle of Armor came around, since it mostly added Pokemon that Drapion dominated. Not only did it absolutely shred Galarian Slowbro, it also had no issue at all with Delmize and Bronzong, and as such, the portion of teams it ripped through after an easily obtained SD boost only increased. Scarf got better too, acting as one of the best answers to the otherwise terrifying Combine Espeon. As if all that wasn't enough, Drapion's team utility increased thanks to its ability to absorb Dragalge's toxic spikes. This didn't last though as Power Creep reared its ugly head once more with the release of the Crown Tundra and Drapion was knocked down to NU. It didn't cease to be viable in RU though, far from it. Its SD set remains quite menacing, tearing through newcomers like Celebi and Roserade. It just has an increased level of specificity regarding the teams it can be used on, whereas before it was quite easy to slap on. This is because it struggles to run all the moves it wants. Since it wants Aqua Tail for Rhyperior but doesn't want to lose the Earthquake that hits Lucario 
Arrow and Registeel, and it can almost never fit Ice Fang to hit Roost Flygon. However, in spite of this, it's still a threat, and none of these issues are insurmountable. It's just that it takes more to overcome them, which limits its use. So how is Drapion in Anu? Once again, it's a great wall breaker, using its resistant latent typing to set up all over common Pokemon like Vileplume and Zatu, while threatening out the likes of Sylveon as well. Once boosted, it blasts through much of the metagame, tearing through many common Pokemon, especially the absolute plethora of excellent grass types that are scattered throughout Anu. Even if Drapion itself doesn't rip through teams with huge bursts of damage on its own, the item removal of its knockoff is enormous. The crippling effect it can have on switch ins like Mudsdale and Quagsire is highly significant. It needs to be precise with both its teammates creating conditions for it to sweep and its choice for when to go for that sweep. This is to compensate for its potentially underwhelming base 90 attack that can leave it coming up just short of being able to KO targets like Vaporeon and Silvali Ground. Again though, this is not insurmountable and the work it takes to overcome this is well worth it when one sees just how terrifying a healthy boosted Drapion can be. Not just because of its speed and power, but because of its great bulk that makes checking it even harder by virtue of being able to survive counterattacks, even those on par with a super effective stab earthquake from Mudsdale. So overall, Drapion is a great part of Generation 8 NU, capping off another solid generation for it. Drapion is very rarely seen in VGC, with only three notable placements over the years. You would think it'd at least be some sort of alternative to Alolan Muck in Gen 7 VGC due to being the same typing and A Muck having a great matchup against all of the Tapus, but alas, it simply has not appeared in notable tournaments after Gen 6. That is until Generation 8, where Giovanni Polanco, aka Green, showed us what Drapion could do given the right meta. Giovanni managed a very impressive placing of top four in the Latin America Players Cup qualifier and 13th in the Players Cup finals. Giovanni's team consisted of a Lilligan Torco Suncor that just disintegrated anything that couldn't stop Drought or Lilligans after you move with Porygon 2 and a G-Max Hatterene Trick Room mode, the latter of which having an enormous special attack that very few things would survive even one hit from. To finalize the team, Giovanni opted for Yoshifu Rapid Strike and Drapion. So why Drapion? Well, Psychic Spam teams were quite common during this time as well as Togekiss and Trick Room in prison teams. If Torko was KO'd, his team would also have trouble against Rillaboom. Drapion seemed to remedy all of these things in one mon. Giovanni even said he tried meta options, but none of them really quite fit what he needed, and he really had to look through the Pokedex to find such a roll compression. Giovanni's Drapion was full-on offensive, with an adamant nature and max attack and speed EVs. It also had the sniper ability with the item Scope Lens. This ensured that its Night Slash and Cross Poison moves had a 50% chance to critical hit. This was great because in addition to damage, Drapion could typically ignore any stat drops and also shreds Togekiss and Rillaboom. Taunt and Protect were his last two moves in order to stop his opponent from using Imprisons. Drapion and Porygon 2 was his safest opener due to being able to stop Trick Room Imprisons so P2 can get Trick Room off safely. Now, there were unfortunately problems that Giovanni ran into during the Players' Cup that prevented him from going further. According to Giovanni, in the Players' Cup, he realized Arcanine gave him a lot of problems because its snarl could lower the special attack of its heavy hitters Torco and Hatterene and versus Drapion specifically it could burn and intimidate Drapion so even with Drapion's 50% chance to crit its damage would still be halved. Nevertheless Giovanni and Drapion still got a great placement at 13th out of 896 qualified players easily one of the biggest VGC tournaments. And special thanks to Giovanni Polanco for the information. And that's it, so how good was Drapion actually? Well, a longtime veteran of the lower tiers, Drapion boasts four successful appearances in Aryu, including a metagame-defining stint in Generation 6. It's also been excellent in Generation 4's UU tier, and currently, it's a great part of Aryu and NU simultaneously, boasting the benefits of several outstanding traits such as Poison Typing, Stat Pursuit, Great Speed, and Source Dance. Drapion has succeeded with many a set over the years. So overall, Drapion has had a thoroughly successful competitive career. Thanks for watching everyone and thank you so much to the patrons for continued support of our videos and for voting for this month's patron pick. And of course, thank you to everyone else watching as well. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Drapion? How would you buff it to have it do something in OU maybe? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.